Hey, FFR listeners, this is the producer Rob speaking. It's that time of year when everyone starts to think about the important things in life, like our taxes. Did you know that a donation to Feminist Frequency is actually tax deductible? If you have a few bucks a month to spare, head on over to patreon.com slash femfreak, F-E-M-F-R-E-Q. Help us out, but also help yourself to all the great exclusive content that's available only to people who are signed up on our Patreon. But I want to be like a furniture maker, uh, except the music comes and I start dancing. Like, (laughs) Mike, you can be multiple things. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio presents Machos Fully Loaded. This is the podcast that asks you to be critical of the media you love. And this season, we're taking a cold, hard look at masculinity in movies and TV. I'm Kat Spada. And I'm AC Lamberty. Uh, this week's show, get your kids their damn earmuffs <laughs> for mature listeners only. Because this R-rated episode is all about machos. Who? Uh... Bosses. 100% pure adrenaline. Weapons. Your move, creep. Dominance. Ain't on her. Machos. The only place you're gonna go is the hospital. I will be right back. Her rental advisory, Tipper Gore, is ready She's shaking. to censor this episode. <laughs> AC, is this too hot for internet radio? I don't know what the rules are. Are, are we making a mistake here? Because we started with teen machos. Mm. You know, and now we're just <laughs> amping it up. NC-17. You know, I if, I feel like if following up an episode about teens uh, <laughs> with an episode about full service sex work is wrong. Honey, I don't want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> Lock me up. <laughs> uh, um, I feel like every week I'm going to be like, the, the motto of this season isn't strap in and strap on, but... <laughs> Also, every week, it that certainly is, the is motto. this week for damn <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about like, and we were talking about movies with macho characters who are exotic dancers, adult films stars, sex workers. Like, I was thinking about that kind of era of sneaking into the living room mm-hmm. to watch Cinemax after hours or like, you know, was there ever a movie that you went to go see or something that your parents were like, that's not for you? Honestly, no. I had so <laughs> little restriction on the internet, uh, which is bad, probably. But I do remember going through kind of like the TV guide on, uh, like with the remote, yeah. where you can like get the little preview of what something was about. Yeah. We didn't really have like full access cable, so I would scroll and find like the porn channels and then right. just like read the descriptions and be like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow, I wonder what that looks like. Wish I could find out. <laughs> <laughs> that's really great because I have to imagine that the descriptions were like a realtor uh, mm-hmm. finds a new client or something. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, wow, that's so erotic to me. I also feel like I was trying to think of kind of formative sex scenes or like yeah. sexy media and was blanking on that but i did consume just a wild amount of fan fiction for teen wolf so uh wow. there's that <laughs> i feel yeah, like a I mean, lot of my experience was like wishing there was more horny yeah. shit going on and then yeah. just getting it through fan fiction you know what i mean it's very uh shocking to me to reveal to you that I also read a lot of fan fiction <laughs> for the television series Teen Wolf. Wow. Which I, I'm just enough older than you that that, that is very weird. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's that weird. Are you steric for life? Yeah, uh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like love... Scott and Styles. Sorry. Like, I'm talking about Teen Machos. <laughs> Scott, uh, Scott that, kid, that kid was cute, but... Um, I don't know, man. I I do love that, like, we didn't have those types of restrictions. Like, my parents wouldn't, I don't think they would be, like, encouraging me to go see stuff. But for the most part, like, one of the first movies I saw in, in theaters, this is not a Machos Who Fuck necessarily, but was The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. <laughs> That's great. Because my parents wanted to see it, and they just took me with them. And they That's were like, one. eh, whatever she doesn't get, she doesn't get. And we'll tell her. Yeah. To not pay attention to stuff, but oh, that's a great uh, early movie to see. Yeah. Wow, wish that 
would have been my experience. I think my first movie in theaters was Anastasia, the animated film. Oh, okay, sure. A that, macho that who has, fucks. That has a, yeah, that has a hunky, <laughs> a hunky cartoon guy in it. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, for me, I when I really do think back, I'm thinking more to uh, un- unscripted. Mm. So I definitely would kind of sneak away to watch uh, Taxi Cab Confessions Ooh. or uh, HBO's Real Sex, yes. which, you know, showed boobs and butts, might have even shown shown front frontal downstairs nudity. <laughs> Side dick, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but it was always like, uh, this episode, we're going to Hedonism 2 to interview <laughs> some, like, middle-aged swingers. And I yeah. was like, this is really... That fantastic stuff. Like, I That's great. I remember not being like titillated by it, but just fascinated. Yeah. Um, I feel like that was my my feeling about it all too. It's more just like anthropological <laughs> intrigue. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. I mean, and this we are like the this sort of cuspy generation too, where um, I could ask Jeeves about just anything. Mm-hmm. And my parents had no idea of what I was getting up to. Yeah. Um, I think now, post Slender Man, maybe <laughs> parents have like a little bit of a better uh, <laughs> handle on like, like it used to be just like, don't go on the internet, strange adults will find your yeah. children. But the reality was like, don't go on the internet, your strange children will find strange adult <laughs> shit to watch. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Certainly um, my experience. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. As a, once and current strange child myself. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I'm going to ease us in to this conversation. So, you know, a little on screen entry level sexuality. More tease than squeeze, more <laughs> please than sleaze. Okay. I <laughs> am attempting iconic blondo weirdo macho yes. Matthew McConaughey. He's showing up. <laughs> you know, I. Wasn't sure that I was going to rewatch the first Magic Mike, and I did. And I rem watching it again. I was like, "Damn, of course he was. He had Oscar buzz. Like they mm-hmm. were talking about Matthew McConaughey before Dallas Buyers Club. They were like, this is yeah. it. He's wearing a fringed G string, oh. <laughs> and he's going to get an Oscar. So good. Didn't even get nominated, <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's dig into some movies about male entertainers. I was writing down my thoughts about the Magic Mike franchise and obviously thought I was going to have just a couple paragraphs, wrote several pages. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I want to kind of disclaim here that uh, anyone who knows me knows that Magic Mike XXL from 2015 is one of my absolute favorite movies of all time. Mm -hmm. But it's not really a movie about machos who fuck. You've seen this, of course, AC. I'm surprised that you don't have... A full podcast about Magic Mike <laughs> and the franchise. Just like scene by scene. Yeah. Um, I, I I feel like what's so great about this movie is that it's friendship cinema. Um, mm. There's like literally no stakes. The bros are getting the band back together and going to a convention in Myrtle Beach. Machos um, who are friends. <laughs> machos who are friends. And like... I remember reading, I think it was Fran Hopfner on Brightwall Dark Room who wrote like, it's not even a stripper competition. It's just a convention. Like, they're just going. <laughs> and like, this isn't what a stripper convention would be. I feel like a stripper convention would be like whole sales people. Yeah. Or like. Vendors. Yeah, v- yeah vendors. <laughs> You'd have a lanyard. Instead, mm-hmm. it's like just, hey, we're here to, to dance. Um, and there's like no romance in this movie. Mike Lane, our hero, befriends a bisexual sad girl. Mm -hmm. And the only point is that he's going to use his dancing to bring her smile back. And that's it. (laughs) It's it's beautiful, really. (laughs) And it's not like, I'm going to bring your smile back, honey. And like, puts his finger in her mouth. It's like, I'm going to bring your smile back. See ya. (laughs) Like, I believe him. Totally. I believe him. Totally. The movie ends, the soundtrack blasts, All I Do Is Win by noted cunnilingus phobe <laughs> DJ Khaled. Everybody's hands do go up and they do mm-hmm. stay there because the pals have just danced. And they danced about things they were interested in and yes. all of the women in the convention center deserve joy. That's it. That's that movie. Totally. Um, I was talking to my friend's husband about <laughs> Magic Mike XXL the other day, and I could tell he didn't think I was serious. And I was like, I'm deadly serious. 
this you is should watch this movie. so funny you say that i was also talking to a friend's husband <laughs> who i saw on letterboxd had logged yeah. magic mike one and two gave him five stars each and when i saw him in person i was like great taste yeah it's like it's the best I mean, magic mike xxl is like the best road film yes. i've seen in years like it's incredible i yeah like i I also find new things every time, like just nuances of Matt Bomer Mm -hmm. as a like sort of level three Reiki healer Uh, or um, fluffy Gabriela Iglesias, who this is actually something um, my friend Lizzie had identified when we first watched the movie in theaters with her mom, um, which is that a lot of the lines in the movie are delivered by like delivered by characters that typically the lines would be delivered by the opposite gender. Oh, interesting. So for example, when all the guys bring Gabriela Iglesias to the hospital because he drove Mm -hmm. with his eyes closed and (laughs) crashed the food truck that they're on a road trip in, um, there's like a, like women doctor and nurse in there who Mm -hmm. are saying like, the guys are like, is he going to be okay? You know, what's wrong with our friend? And these women are like, he's going to be fine. He just needs some rest. Like, He's just I, so high. Yeah, <laughs> they're all just coming down off of Molly. But um, I went back and rewatched the predecessor, which is Steven mm. Soderbergh's Magic Mike from 2012, which the story of this movie, like the lore is that it was inspired by Channing Tatum's real life experiences mm. as a stripper. Who? Sorry um, to interrupt, but who directed yeah. XXL? Was it not Soderbergh? Oh, good question. It was technically Gregory Jacobs, who I think is Soderbergh's like AD or something. Okay. But everyone theorizes that actually Soderbergh did direct it, but there were some like guild reasons why he couldn't put his oh, name I on see. it. Okay. It is shot and I shot, I think, and edited for sure by Soderbergh using his alternate Got names. It. Okay. So it's very interesting because I feel like Steven Soderbergh wants to make these gritty stories. Yeah. And then XXL is so different that it seems like it doesn't have his fingerprints on it, but it does. So yeah. Maybe and then you just... see Magic Mike's Last Dance, and it's yes. like so much more in the spirit of XXL, which it will is. get you, I assume. But yeah, I mean, that's so. That's what's interesting about this trilogy. It's like the first movie and the third movie. I do think touch more on like what transactional sexuality is mm-hmm. and looks like. The second movie. It's like about the joy of movement (laughs) more than it is about like, we're going to strip. We got to use our bodies to make money. It's like the marketplace. Yeah. Like (laughs) the first movie, I think, is really mostly very dreary. Mm -hmm. Um, The dancing isn't that impressive. It's it is more aligned with the kind of crappy strip shows that you might go see in Tampa. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, with just like people stomping around pretending to be firefighters. Um, And these are just kind of guys who maybe their big dream is to make it up the big leagues in Miami. Mm. Um, They found themselves doing this, but there's a lot of drug use. And if they get Mm. addicted or they decide they want more money and they get involved in, in like dealing, this is, this is about like tragedy and drama. Mm. Um. Not for, you know, I don't know. It just even watching it again, it, it's better than I remembered it. It is a good movie, but because it's so different from Magic Mike XXL, I'm like, I do not yeah. want that. <laughs> um, but I really was glad that I rewatched it because of how it talks about like what stripping is. Like, what is the workplace of stripping? What is the performer exchanging? Like, what's the unspoken contract that's being exchanged between the performer and the audience. Right. Um, Matthew McConaughey plays (laughs) Dallas, who is the MC of the Kings of Tampa. A job I should have, by the way. (laughs) You 100% should. Like, uh, what's interesting about this is that, like, he's, like, maybe, I don't know, is he, like, a former stripper? Like, he strips sometimes, and then there's other times where he's, like, I'm not going to get out there. Like, yeah. I'm just here to be an MC. I but... recall that from watching that like a year or two ago, too. It's just like he's like a mascot in a way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which eventually be- becomes uh, Jada Pinkett Smith in yes. the second movie. To quote Ira Madison the third, she's giving her best Michigan J. Frog <laughs> in that movie. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is so good. Oh it's my god, accurate too. I've like <laughs> gone back and rewatched like WB <laughs> intro video on YouTube, and I was like, no, for real. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my god. Uh, okay, I'm gonna tear so, up. But continue. <laughs> so yeah, like Magic Mike is mostly takes mostly takes place in this like cabaret, uh, in front of a cabaret audience of like bachelorettes and girls who've just turned 21 and he starts the movie the very first scene is just him saying like he's touching he's groping his own body touching his butt his legs his chest and saying can you touch this no 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 can you touch this no 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 but then punchline i see a lot of lawbreakers in here oh so good so good but like off the top it's very interesting that it's like you know, when we have, like, men on display for an audience of women, the concept is, like, well, the rules are are rules, but not really. Like, you're not, they're not in danger from you. This isn't really harm that we want to protect these dancers from. Right. It's like the power dynamic is still maintained despite the differences in, like, labor and performance. Yeah, like, I have been to a handful of strip clubs with women dancers and like i suppose like they have different rules depending on the state depending on the county depending on the proprietor but like for the most part i do feel like um a well operated strip club is hopefully going to protect its like female dancers from clientele Mm -hmm. and right off the bat it's like "Mm, this isn't really this isn't perilous for these men yeah, and I can't think of a film or TV show about women who are strippers or dancers that have that same kind of approach. Like, I watched Showgirls recently. Yeah. Almost a core tenant of that film are the clientele being just horrible and handsy yeah. and inappropriate. Like, I can't, I, it feels like a distinctly masculine point of view um, yeah. for sex workers. There's, um, I've only watched a few episodes of P Valley, but everyone mm. I know who watches it loves it. I've got to, um, go back to that. I think I let my stars lapse, but <laughs> there's some other kind of descriptions about what this work is in the first Magic Mike movie. Uh, at one point it's described as 25% dancing, 50% marketing, which <laughs> I love that so much. Like I heard that and it, about two hours later, I was like, that's kind of not a perfect 100%. joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, like, there's this this main kind of secondary character played by uh, Alex Pettifer, who's the new oh, stripper. Yeah. And they say, well, he's young, he's good looking, he can't dance for shit, but that's teachable. Mm-hmm. And again, it's like, well, that's, it, it's not about skill. Yeah. That's not what they're trading in here. In the second and third movies, it is very much about skill. And that's yeah. what kind of elevates like they're saying that this type of work is an art form um mm. but in the first movie it's just like meh are you gonna we know t- why we're here yeah you're gonna make some drunk women horny and that's right. enough um and then there's this part that i was like boy i don't feel like channing tatum wanted to say this line at all Oof. but they <laughs> wrote it in <laughs> Which is he has this like kind of love interest, who cares? Um, and she's like, she says something like, um, I can't support your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And he's like, am I being Magic Mike right now? This is what I do, but it's not who I am. Huh. And that's really something because I think that the character of Mike actually does He carries that for the rest of the trilogy. Totally. I was going to say it very much is who he is in the next two. Yeah, but he struggles with that. He's like, but I want to be like a furniture maker, uh, except the music comes and I start dancing. Like, (laughs) (laughs) And also it's like, Mike, you can be multiple things. You can make upcycled like thrift store furniture and you can be someone who like changes people's lives by giving them the night of their lives i don't know it's it's very i feel like it doesn't entirely know what it's going to be about in this first movie but um obviously an eventually yeah. iconic trilogy well, so yeah like, like too millennial with it but please. like thinking about 
the constant push to monetize aspects of your life Mm. or identity and like that being so central to who you are like I don't know if I have a hobby do you know what I mean like that that isn't something that is a venture at the same time Uh, which I think is ultimately kind of a negative thing but seems like kind of the central identity piece of these movies Mm -hmm. um I don't think it's as serious as that (laughs) yeah (laughs) per se except for maybe in the first one but yeah yeah, the, the the taking something that you are interested in or good at or find joy in, and then that becomes something that is an identity group or like, yeah. you know, identifying factor about yourself that maybe makes you money too. Right, right. Like it's important to have elements of your life that aren't tied to subsistence. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, that's not what these guys are exploring necessarily. Yeah. The third movie, which came out earlier this year, Magic Mike's Last Dance, mm-hmm. is a uh, it's very different. I mean, it's it's inspired by the stage show Magic Mike Live, which I highly recommend. <laughs> but it kind of sets up like Mike is kind of offering the boyfriend experience to Selma Hayek Pino. Yeah. She offers him six thousand dollars for a dance yeah and then they end up sleeping together so he's like oh i'm not gonna take that money and then she offers him like 60 grand to go to london and save the theater or whatever yeah so he has like a zoom call with the boys from magic mike xxl and tarzan it's so great i loved how choppy it was yes (laughs) (laughs) um tarzan played by kevin nash who, by the way, I looked up Kevin Nash mm-hmm. and like I thought his own bio that he would write himself would be like actor and former professional wrestler. Yeah. Instead, it's actor and equal rights advocate or activist. Oh my God, get him on the pod. I know. I was like, Kevin Nash. No, I've, I knew I loved you. I was going to say, is he your favorite of the original boys in XXL? No. Um, I like him a lot, but I really do like, <laughs> I really like the journey of a uh, big Dick Richie played by Joe Manganiello. Oh my God. Because his chemistry with Andy McDowell, who definitely did oh. not know they were filming. She just was talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's delightful. It's absolutely. Yes. And like that he's interested in finding the one. Oh, amazing. So there's this Zoom call in Magic Mike's Last Dance where he talks to the guys and he's like, yeah, I'm in London. This lady offered me this money to come do stuff. And uh, but it's not it's not like sexual. It's not like that. And Tarzan is like, hey, sex work is work. Don't be ashamed about this arrangement. There's nothing wrong with it. Loved that. Uh, But then, you know, it's Hollywood. So Mm -hmm. at the end of the movie, it's not like sex worker does good it's like oh they fell in love so no money has to exchange hands don't we feel better about that yeah commerce is taken out of it so it's it's good and just yeah and i i mean this movie isn't like interested in having a moral position (laughs) statement probably but um for the purposes of this conversation i think uh yeah it's like magic mike the trilogy is almost not appropriate for the machos who fuck uh, conversation, mm-hmm. but I do think it fits better here than in the Machos Who Dance, although mm-hmm. we'll get there. <laughs> and if you've seen the Magic Mike trilogy, and I would be shocked if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't, um, <laughs> I recommend the documentary This One's for the Ladies, which came out, I think, in 2018. It's uh, an exploration of male strippers in the Black community. Uh, there's also one queer woman stripper who's featured. Um, and it investigates it a lot more closely. Like we saw this glimpse into uh, male entertainers uh, providing dancing and um, entertainment for women in Magic Mike XXL. But this movie goes closer into like what these some real life dancers and audience members get out of this uh, world. I got to say that yeah. scene in XXL is probably my favorite of the whole movie. Yeah. I mean, the introduction of Jada Pinkett Smith, I can't stop thinking about Michigan J frog now. <laughs> um, and also kind of the, the Donald Glover singing jump scare. It's yes. So funny to me. <laughs> He's it's such a strange choice. Like, or everyone in that, like Michael Strahan, 
Yes. Is, it, he was like football player turned Kelly Ripa co-host yeah. turned absolute dominating dancer. Like, yeah. he's so great in that scene. Yes. It is like capital W what women want. <laughs> 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 that whole scene i mean it's great is, that's the last mel gibson reference that we'll get this season um obviously contractually steven twitch boss who recently passed away mm. who is in that and i have loved so you think you can dance for years uh it's yeah but it is a really beautiful scene and then the fact that just everyone knows what Jada Pinkett's going on about and is on board with it is so great. Yeah. Like, there's no learning curve. It's just like, I've got a ghost. What happens yes. when a ghost shows up? Queens. And <laughs> <it's> like, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to kind of, like, extrapolate that a bit, a lot of content, and especially the stuff we're talking about today, about sex work, be it strippers or, like, sex workers, hustlers, whatever, so much of the media I'm finding is just you are thrown into the world and expected to acclimate and get mm. it. And if you're on board, you're on board. And if you're not, you're not. Uh, yeah. Which I really like. I like an immersive world like that. And I think that XXL kind of does that, um, especially in that, that Jada Pinkett Smith world. So one more thing to talk about, taking us from the stage to the big screen, because this is a before home video. This is when you used to go to the theater to watch nudie movies <laughs> i feel like we have to address uh hollywood's best known exploration of the that other film industry uh mm -hmm. in southern california boogie nights 1997 paul thomas anderson absolute top 10 for me of all time it is so good mm -hmm. like i watched i put it on last night and i was like i just want to watch a little bit of it for this conversation obviously i was up late watching the whole thing because i was like i'm not gonna not watch alfred molina oh my god <laughs> i i've been saying i'm gonna go as him for halloween this year in that oh movie. my god S so good um i'll follow around with little like firecrackers <laughs> <laughs> throwing them around that would be fun this uh this movie i mean if you haven't seen it it's it's like the best like this is paul thomas anderson showing you what he's about as a filmmaker um and it's uh, features this main character, Dirk Diggler, set in 1977, who is this like ingenue of the adult film industry. And here's what I really thought was interesting about this. There, it's like an, uh, an ensemble cast. There's a lot of characters with different motivations, different tragedies and strengths and weaknesses and whatever. But our, our hero, Dirk, he doesn't get into porn because it's a last resort. He doesn't get into it because he's down on his luck or whatever. He gets into it because he sees that using his body is his best avenue for a mm -hmm. life of like fame and respect and love. His mother- It's not even money, which is interesting. Um, yeah. Because there's similar themes that will come up in, in Midnight Cowboy, but uh, yeah. more money focused whereas in to my memory Dirk Diggler is more just like I want I literally want to see my name in lights you have that whole yeah. moment yeah. where he comes up with his porn name yeah. yeah he it like eventually of course the money comes the drugs come definitely a perk yeah he wants the car and uh I'm going to buy these fucking shoes yeah a dojo themed yeah. bedroom <laughs> um <laughs> but there are scenes of him where his mom is is yelling at him that you're stupid and you're you're a loser, you can't do anything and he says, "I was blessed with one special thing." And throughout the movie, it is referred to as both beautiful and huge. I won't say the word. Just kidding. <laughs> um and then we get to see a prosthetic version of this huge beautiful cock at the very end of the movie. Incredible. There's also this kind of like twist. I don't know. I haven't I haven't really fully figured out how I feel about it, but there were a few Oscar nominated performances in this. We know that many of these actors are like top tier mm -hmm. at, at the craft and they are playing p like bad actors. Yeah. And that's something that's sort of, I never really thought about before. Like, is there, is there a level of disrespect here Mm -hmm. And I don't really think so. Like, I don't think Julianne Moore necessarily feels like I'm better than Amber Waves, the character right. that she plays. I think she does such a beautiful job in that role. 
Um, but some of the characters are very clear about like Don Cheadle repeatedly is like, I'm not a pornographer. I'm an actor. Mm-hmm. I just also do this. Or Dirk Diggler and John C. Riley, um, they want to be in real movies, but yeah. those real movies are are uh have explicit sex in them. That's fascinating to me because I am really interested in porn that is cinema, especially from like the golden age of porn. So mm-hmm. your Fred Halsteads, your Wakefield Pools. Um, I mean, those are like gay porn directors, but mm-hmm. they have work that is so cinematic and has been shown like Fred Halstead's work was shown at, I think it was MoMA in like the seventies mm. and eighties um, was presented in an art house context, despite having unsimulated explicit sex. He was like in the art world kind of begrudgingly as a result. Um, so it's, it's interesting that there is like a straight up distinction um, yeah. for these actors. Um, and I think maybe that is also by virtue of being in the mainstream por- porn world in this film right. um, in Boogie Nights. Um, Whereas there is a whole subculture of like sexually explicit art house film yeah. um, that I will talk about later. Um, but yeah, just, just an interesting distinction there um, yeah. in, the, in the mainstream, at least. And finally, watching this movie, I mean, every five minutes I was like, is Mark Wahlberg the best actor on the planet? It's his best performance ever. Like, it's, it's amazing. It's so good. Like everything from the way he clears his throat when he's supposed to be just on tons of coke to the way his face looks like the babe in the woods at the beginning and then looks like a strung out, like at rock bottom guy at the end. And Dirk Diggler is played by iconic Dunce Mark Wahlberg. Mm -hmm. I just feel like thinking about machos fully loaded and like the whole why we talk are talking about this season i had to like just dig into actual marky mark <laughs> oh, for a minute no. because oh, no. he is among the most probl- problematic machos whom i've loved performances of mm-hmm. in spite of myself uh, i will have no compunction saying that he is a dirt bag to put it mildly yeah. he has a history of racism violence and homophobia and currently he has a very strong fetish for catholicism he currently has like an app that's like mark Wahlberg's 40 day challenge and it's like a no. Lent app yeah oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> and you can he has like oh. he posted his schedule online and it was like 5 a.m yeah. mass 6 a.m workout 7 a.m mass i was like cool yeah. so uh, strange so strange um but like I remember seeing him in fear. I mean, that was an early movie that I was like turned on by, and mm. was n- that was a new experience, like yeah. watching a movie and being like, "Oh my god, like this guy's scary." But I see, I see this, and I'm like excited by it. Um, totally. And then you know, now he is like whatever the executive producer of entourage or <laughs> that's like, <laughs> it's like a 20 year old reference at this point. But um, I feel like it's important just to say, like I am talking very lovingly about his performance in boogie nights, which I think is excellent. Um, but he, he's been, you know, there's a lot of his past that is abhorrent and he has said he regrets some of these youthful actions from the benign, like, dedicating his 1992 memoir, Marky Mark, to his penis. You know, uh, I'll, I'll say it. I'll go on record and say that he shouldn't regret that. The rest I don't of the think stuff, he should regret he that can. at all. Absolutely. <laughs> I also remember reading a snippet where he says, of his third nipple, it's dope and bitches like to suck it. I love that, actually. That's just been in my head for years. <laughs> Um, you can also watch, there's a video, he had a workout tape uh, back in the Marky Mark days, and there's, like, some like sexy lady doing like bicep curls or something. Mm-hmm. And he's looking down her shirt in this mu- in this workout tape. And he's like, Ugh, that view. <laughs> I just remember being like, ah, <laughs> like, who is for this? For sure. For sure. This is me. Like all girls school being like, what are boys? Is this what boys are? <laughs> um, but then, you know, you grow up, you find out he has, participated in racist violent mm-hmm. assault and he has uh spoken about that and he's uh said he was on drugs but he's also apologized and he's tried to get like a pardon for this stuff um 
He's even apologized for claiming that he could have changed the course of events on 9-11. So this Would've is who different. we're dealing with. Um, and finally, just before I wrap up on Boogie Nights, um, I wanted to shout out canonically beloved blonde man, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Hell yeah. <laughs> My twin. My twin. His uh, also his love of Dirk in that oh in this my movie. God. I had remembered the scenes like where he tries to kiss him or where he sees him for the first time and like the yeah. the screen just goes black except for this little central p- perspective on Dirk. But every time Philip Seymour Hoffman is in a shot like a, a the full room at the Adult Video Awards or whatever, mm-hmm. he's trying to get his hands on Dirk. Yes. And it's completely believable. It's so good. A um, proxy for the audience in some ways, perhaps. For sure. Um, context, yeah. The movie also stars uh, Thomas Jane in a small role who later uh, plays like a down on his luck teacher in the show Hung, who becomes an escort because he just wants his kids back. <laughs> and uh, and then last year's movie, Good Luck Leo Grand, which has Daryl McCormick in it as yeah. an escort. Uh, the movie's more about the client Emma Thompson in that movie uh, in that storyline, mm-hmm. but you know, and there's stuff that they don't get into that I feel like they should. Definitely. Like Daryl McCormick is a black man; he's Irish. Like there's a, a number of. Uh, race and class issues that they kind of touch on um but it's very affecting and and uh heart heartwarming movie so um Mm -hmm. yeah lots lots to add to the letterbox list of uh horny absolutely wow what um what a good pick these two um boogie nice in conversations with magic mike is very interesting as like both kind of period pieces in a way, like thinking about the first one set during this 2008 recession and that Mm -hmm. being like kind of the economic backdrop of the whole thing. Yeah. And then the seventies being kind of a boom time for porn, especially. And yet it seems kind of like the motivations for our main characters, Mike Lane and Dirk Diggler are like a little bit similar. Mm -hmm. It's like they love the work. They like, and they want to be, they want to be special. Yeah. They they want to be more than yeah. the high school kid dropout who's a waiter or the, right. you know, well, I, I, I work for a roofing company, but I'm really trying to get my furniture business off the gra- ground. Right. But with their sexuality, they can be something superhuman. Yeah. Oh, that's like beautiful. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's, like, <why. laughs> it's like aspirational almost. Yeah. 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 I want a Boogie Nights sequel that is like Magic Mike XXL and is just <laughs> fun. <Yeah>. <laughs> and like, Goofy and William H. Macy doesn't blow his brains out. Don't uh, tempt me to write some AO3 Ooh. about this. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of fanfic, yeah. yeah. I'm sure there is Boogie Nights fanfiction out there. I'm sure. I- I'll link it in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on that, on our uh, kind of entry-level sexuality, as Kat called it, it's time to get triple X rated, y'all. Um, my picks this week, we have American New Wave Masterpiece Midnight Cowboy, directed by John Schlesinger, and the half-art house, half-porno, 100% new queer cinema romp that is Bruce LaBruce's Hustler White. Um content warning for sexual assault going mm. forward. It's pretty explicit in Midnight Cowboy. Um, we'll be talking a bit about that. Um, Kat, have you seen either of these films? I have not. And I don't think I've heard of Hustler White before. Great. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Perfect. Um, so let me give you some background first, um, especially on Hustler White, just because I think uh, a lot of listeners will not be familiar with it. But Both films are so brilliant. Um, I had never seen either before watching them for this episode. Mm. Both films are directed by openly gay men, um, and they center around characters who are full-service sex workers before the age of the internet. Was was John Schlesinger openly, like, out at the time of the movie? Wow. Yeah, he was openly gay um, during the filming and during the awards run. It won a ton of Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, um, Best Adapted Screenplay. Mm. Um, And he 
I think was in a relationship with like the location scout or someone who worked on the film. Mm -hmm. Um, So he was out the whole time, which is like pretty unique for a 1969 film. But absolutely. um, So Midnight Cowboy follows Joe Buck. I mean, damn, talk about freaky blonde man, John Voight. Uh, oh wow which i don't know if he knows he was in this movie but he does a damn good job in it um so <laughs> the joe, joe buck <laughs> to buck angel pipeline <laughs> <laughs> me as hell um joe buck is a very sweet and incredibly simple texan boy who moves to new york with a dream to make it as an escort to manhattan's wealthy women um so very dirk diggler very mike lane um it kind of starts out initially as like he just has a dream and he knows that he's good at sex and so he's gonna go and try and cash in uh it's kind of like like a boom boom time you know Mm -hmm. um but we find out along the way that he's also processing some intense trauma uh there are a lot of hints at child sexual abuse from his caretaker he lived Mm. with his grandma his whole life um and some just i mean incredible filmmaking horrific Hor- like horror montages mm. um, where we see Joe and his girlfriend Annie back in Texas. Um, Annie is considered kind of the town whore, quote mm. unquote, um, has a reputation for being crazy. We hear men talking about her in really kind of horrible, disparaging ways. Um, and in these flashbacks, we see that Joe and Annie are both raped by a group of men in town. Oh, wow. Um, it's very intense, truly edited and shot like a horror film. Yeah. Um, and so maybe he is this is what he's escaping maybe this is something that he's trying to repair it's it's very nebulous but throughout it's a very rich text about loneliness about money about entertainment in america sexuality and there's so much there i'm sure there have been books written about it mm-hmm. something that there have been virtually no books written about actually which i was really shocked by in my research on this is hustler white mm-hmm. uh which is so genius so funny so yeah. enjoy like such a great watch um so it's directed by bruce LaBruce. um film scholar eugenie brinkma describes him as a cinephile a pornographer a former grad student in <laughs> film theory founder of the homo core movement in canada which was an effort to introduce erotic anarchy into the sexually complacent and homophobic punk movement LaBruce is simply too many things um huge working director in the new queer cinema movement um and he actually put out a movie last year um but his his filmography is you know notorious for blurring the lines between art and porn Mm. uh this quote from brinkma in this piece that i read one of the only pieces i could find really discussing his filmography um says that labrusse's films insist that a spectator get off on art and think seriously about porn Mm. which is like so completely true about his work yeah um and he is like the definition of camp. He's it's like if John Waters were making like pornos, essentially. Um, I'm glad that you I'm glad that you brought up John Waters because yeah. I was thinking about him. There's this line in Boogie Nights. Uh, Don Cheadle's trying to get a bank loan, and the banker was like, "You're a pornographer. We're not going to f- mm. uh, finance a, a peddler of filth." Yeah, and John Waters has been he's em- embraced i mean he's he's the filth is a word that you associate right. with john waters but he is still like in hollywood he's still yeah. on the um i would say that like most people would know who john waters is like mm-hmm. hairspray went to broadway and then had zach efron in it you know like yeah it's become very mainstream to some extent, I mean, I'm sure there are people who will never see Pink Flamingos, but who right. will go see Hairspray with their moms on Broadway. Um, Definitely. But so it's like, yeah, John Waters is still on one side of the line. And on right. the other side of the line, it seems like is is Bruce LaBruce, who would, I imagine, be a big influence on like, I re- can't remember the filmmaker, Short Bus, like the other. Yeah, John Cameron Mitchell. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was John Cameron Mitchell. Right. Like the movie. other kind of independent cinema that includes explicit sex and doesn't yeah. shy away from that yeah for sure it's it's interesting i am a huge john waters fan have seen all of his films he's like a saint to me mm-hmm. but he definitely started as extremely independent and mm-hmm. self-financing much of his films i think until um hairspray or maybe polyester i forget i think hairspray came first but 
Um, it's interesting that he's kind of infiltrated Hollywood. I still think that he has a hard time getting things made relative. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely like still like uses filth as a badge of honor, but is still able to communicate to the mainstream. I think where LaBruce is different is that he is a pornographer. Like he, I think yeah. he cops to that and is straight up identifies as somebody who makes porn films, um, which is complicated in both the art world and the porn world. And yeah. I mentioned Wakefield Pool and Fred Halstead earlier, um, but they're in similar positions where it's like, well, I'm too porno- pornographic for the art world, mm. too artistic for the porn world. Like, where does this kind of live? And that's yeah. why there's kind of this dearth of you know scholarly literature about them. Um, but two podcasts I would highly recommend if people are interested in these topics. One is Pure Garbage by Wussy Magazine about John Waters. They interview him in an episode. It's great. And then the other is Ask Anybody mm. um, by Elizabeth Purchell, which is just each episode is a deep dive into one of uh, the golden age of porns uh, and gay films. It's very interesting. I think it's also important to note, like in the feminist conversation, right? There have been various perspectives on pornography in the feminist movement like Mm -hmm. the second and third waves a a third wave of feminism in the 90s i think was extremely um resistant to porn and found it uh you know and they were responding to a a real misogyny and um and violence against women right yeah when we talk about like gay porn we're we're talking about an even more like marginalized group of Mm -hmm. um creators performers like an industry that is not as entrenched as the like the uh, san fernando valley pornography that a lot of feminist critics have talked about i read the book uh the feminist porn book which goes Mm -hmm. into like how there are ways to be a feminist and embrace pornography or enjoy pornography and also it's not something that like I think anybody's saying like you have to be into it or you have to right. like it. It just is a a reality. Like it's a real thing for people. It's something that people mm-hmm. work in and they put art into. Um I you know, I think I mentioned in the first episode you have a Tom of Finland tattoo. Yeah. There's yeah, yeah. this beautiful movie about Tom of Finland that came out a couple of years ago, funded by the Finnish government's like art council. Mm-hmm. Um he was a he was an artist. He was a an artist working uh, in advertising, like doing illustrations for for advertising, and also he was doing this like transgressive and life saving uh, pornographic work, and that yeah. is something that has influenced generations of subcultures. I think there's also a different cultural, like pornography is situated different mm-hmm. culturally for gay men. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking from that point of view, which I'll get into with Hustler White later on. Um, But it just occupies a different cultural space. And I think that a lot of the art films like Bruce LaBruce and all all of his work speak to that in varying ways. Like they are Mm -hmm. identity films kind of at the end of the day, um, whether he wants them to be or not. Um, But yeah, so much different from kind of mainstream straight porn in that way as well. Um, For example... Uh, to kind of get, give you an idea of tonally what we're working with with Bruce LaBruce. Um, his most recent film, St. Narcisse from 2022, I think, um, follows a very hot young man who finds out that he has mm. a twin brother who is a monk in a monastery and they meet wow. and they have sex with each other. So <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the kind of Which, vibe like, we're working 2022, with. 2022, that's, um, that's very transgressive. Like that's going to be, that's fascinating. Cool was not a wide release, believe it or not. Um, anyway, Hustler White, we see LaBruce play himself as Jurgen Anger, no relation to Kenneth Anger, as is joked many times. Um, he's an academic doing research on the gay hustling scene in Los Angeles in the 90s. Um, and on his trip to LA, he hires Monty Ward, played by Tony Ward, uh, a sex worker who joins him and kind of shows him the ropes, the sights, all the hustling, uh, all the stuff that the hustling and kink scene has to offer. Um, and what's fascinating to me is that it's formatted like Sunset Boulevard. It opens with Monty face down in this like shitty apartment complex jacuzzi. And as such is just such a fun, sharp satire on the portrayals of sex work. Like the night cowboy itself, there are some like direct references to it. 
uh, in mainstream media. And of course, there is mm. full on unsimulated sex. Um, highly recommend. It's a great time. Is there um, is Midnight Cowboy one of the like Hollywood movies that also portrays unsimulated sex? No, there isn't really mm. a ton of sex in it to begin with, which is interesting. Um, there's a lot of insinuation. They do some really great uh, like mm. stand in orgasm moments, you know, like, like there's this montage of this TV flickering and channels changing rapidly until there's right. like a building demolition. Um, so that kind of like, yeah, montage stuff. Yeah. Uh, but no, unsimulated there were a sex. couple of movies in the, like the seventies um, that were, were going there, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So there are a lot of similarities with both films as kind of mentioned, both about sex workers, both directed by gay men, both about, you know, full service sex work. Um, I, I was really interested in the worlds of each film, particularly like how we access them as viewers. Um, and that's what sets them apart from one another. And by that, I mean that Midnight Cowboy is about a straight man looking to engage in straight sex work, mm-hmm. kind of like Magic Mike. Uh, and then Hustler White is about gay male hustling. So Midnight Cowboy's world of sex work is initially presented to us as escapism. Joe Buck is escaping from his mundane life in Texas. Uh, Mm. He's going to New York City to chase a dream, to be with beautiful women, to make a ton of money. Um, You know, that American dream theme that kind of permeates a lot of sex work media. Um, And then we come to understand that it's perhaps him running away from trauma. So, for example, when we... well. Also, the context <laughs> is he's bad at hustling. Yeah. Like, he's, he's not good at this. He, like, has one client that actually pays in, like, the entire movie. Um, so he has this a successful meetup with a woman. He meets at a party and then pays for his services. And he's distraught and he's tense and emotional after they have sex. He didn't enjoy the experience as much as he thought he would. Um, and it kind of leads him to mm. decide he doesn't want to do it anymore. He doesn't rebuke the profession, but... He says, hell, I ain't no kind of hustler. It's got to yeah. be an easier way of making a living than this. And then thinks about doing uh, construction mm. work or other physical labor, which I also find fascinating. Um, using your body but for it, work. It's, it's not the dream. It's not the goal is to like be the best hustler. It's, it's a means to an end. Right. Which is, I think that kind of sets it apart from Boogie Nights in that way. Like Boogie Nights feels like the outlier in that it's the performance, the actual mm-hmm. work is the dream, yeah. not what comes from it. Um, but regardless, with Midnight Cowboy presented as escapism, the trauma isn't actually the sex work itself. It's mm. about the trauma of poverty and the trauma of capitalism and the grift and the American dream, which I feel like is not the case with a lot of right. movies about women who are sex workers. I feel like it's the trauma of right. the actual act itself. Because men um, are yeah. entitled to be American individuals. And women are part mm. of a ma- like a, a subservient class. Like maybe that's that's right. the tragedy, right? For a fallen man is different. Yes, totally. Yeah. It's that you failed at something, honestly, um, and weren't able to make your dream come true in this way. But I find that world really interesting. It's presented as escapism, whereas Hustler White's world of gay sex work mm. is presented as the mundane which is so yeah. delightful to watch, truly. Um, the actual hustling and the sex and the clientele isn't shocking. I mean, it's it's wild to see unsimulated mm-hmm. sex in an art house film, but once you get over it, it's not something that anybody is trying to use as escape. Uh, both, uh, both films see hustling as this form of mobility, but Hustler White really treats mm-hmm. the hustlers like employees. Um, so for example, and and like kind of subverts these typical sex work tropes. So there is a scene where a young man dressed as a cowboy is Uh standing on a Santa Monica Boulevard and is picked up by an older man also dressed as a cowboy with a really thick accent in a car. They get to this guy's apartment. The young man is kind of telling his sob story about how he came to LA and is just trying to make some money. And the John is just kind of like, yeah, okay, I don't really care let's let's get to it and the guy and the sex worker is like okay and then they yeah. happily have this insane sex scene and it's really subverting the sadness and the circumstances that are that in a girl that reminds like me Cowboy. did you see um uh, special i want to say it's ryan o'connell who mm-hmm. uh stars in that and he yes has been very open about like experiences with sex workers as a gay man with disability 
Yeah. And in his show, he has um, Brian Jordan Alvarez like in the show as a sex worker. And it is like, it is a mon- mundane, like, this is just part of life. Like, it's not something that is, that has like a strong moral piece. There's not like a huge decision making in it. It's just right. like, well, like, you know, you go to get your hair cut by a professional and sometimes you get off with a professional. Like, and. Absolutely. Yeah. Which I think is quite unique to gay content. I mean, even thinking about Magic Mike and Magic Mike XXL, there's still, like yeah. we talked about, there's still some moralizing there a bit. And whether it's intentional or not, I mean, XXL mm-hmm. is more of a romp, more of a, a road movie, but it's definitely still there. Yeah. So also in both films, uh, queerness is very inherent to both stories to varying degrees. I mean, as discussed, both films have openly gay men uh, who directed them. But both films were met with backlash in different ways upon their release. Um, so LaBruce has always had detractors both within and outside of the gay community for showing very shocking and subversive sex acts. It's, you know, similar to John Waters, uh, queer respectability mm-hmm. politics will always exist. There will be community members who always reject shocking, you know, pieces of art. And that same thing happened here. Um, and Midnight Cowboy was met with, you know, fairly homophobic reception for the time. It was 1969. Um, amidst a wave of public sentiment kind of growing against gay people. Um, I was reading a piece that pulled out a headline from the New York Times around the release of uh, Midnight Cowboy that said, growth of overt homosexuality in Mm -hmm. city provokes wide concern. Um, But at the same time, I found recent scholarly work that called Midnight Cowboy an inaccurate or dated portrayal of queerness, which I kind of find funny. It's like, it's... I don't think we need to rewrite that history per se, because I really enjoy that both films problematize or uh, like, I think accurately portray elements of gay relationships as in like truly basic relationships, not like romantic or sexual, but uh, you know, an exchange, a transaction, um, a relationship that is for pleasure or for money, not necessarily for community. Um, so during one of uh, Jurgen Anger's interview, uh, he, there's like kind of an interview voiceover throughout the whole of Hustler White. Uh, he asks Monty, the main hustler, uh, "Are you gay or straight?" To which Monty says, yeah. "I don't. I'm a hustler," which I think is such a basic distillation that totally. really applies to both films. That's what I want to ask um, you about. Is like yeah. the especially in the more like mainstream Hollywood stuff, the sense that when men and probably I would say anyone, but these men start engaging in sex work of some mm-hmm. form, they then are more like, um, they have more proximity to queerness. And like, yes. I love the part in Magic Mike XXL where they go to a drag show and there's no like gay panic about it. Like, oh, it's so course, lovely. Like, yeah. Vogue's because he wants to like win the Vogue off or whatever. <laughs> there's no like, oh, I wouldn't do that. I'm not yeah. gay. I only dance for women. Like there's no piece of that in 2015 in this 2015 movie in boogie nights like there's so much about like if you're going to be a a porn star then like all these men are going to be looking at your at your penis and like how how's that feel and it feels fine eventually you know and he also has experienced like some elements of like being paid by men to jerk off or whatever it is um but it's oh, yeah. almost like, well, once you've gone, once you've transgressed, you know, then you're now like on the side <laughs> of um, homos. I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm saying that in the way that I feel yeah. like uh, Burt Reynolds like character might say something. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like once you have crossed the line, there's there's other lines that you've crossed as well. And that's that's really something. Like, what Absolutely. do you think about that as like a gay man who could that be like part of why these are compelling stories? Yeah. Well, thinking about Midnight Cowboy specifically, it's interesting because when Joe fails to pick up any women or to successfully work for or with women, he, there are two incidents where Mm -hmm. he engages in like gay sex work. Um, And it is horrible for him. He doesn't want to do it. I mean, to the credit of the film, Mm -hmm. he's never violent or anything to these men. Um, or to anybody really, which is kind of fascinating to me in its own way. Um, but it's something that is done out of a res- like a last resort and something he definitely does not identify with and something that he and 
I guess his companion or friend, uh, Enrico Razzo mm-hmm. Rizzo, played by Dustin Hoffman, um, who's kind of a calm man who takes him in as like, I don't know, he, he describes himself right. as Joe's management. Uh, they're both <laughs> very bad at their jobs again. <laughs> um, uh, Rizzo is constantly commenting on his cowboy aesthetic and being like, that is something that gay men are into. Mm. Like you are in the wrong, like you're going to, uh, uh, you're only going to be pigeonholed into gay sex work if you keep right. embracing this aesthetic. Um, that is a very yeah, nice yeah, yeah. how he says it. Um, um, and yet their relationship is the most right gay of the whole movie. I mean, it's it really reminded me a lot of mm-hmm. Pony Boy and Johnny and The Outsiders, which we talked about last episode, um, in that they care so deeply for one another. I think. I mean, as it was kind of our thesis in the Team Machos episode, there with with Joe and Rizzo in Midnight Cowboy, there is mm-hmm. less access to emotionality or, and less of an ability to articulate how they feel about one another. But the whole movie starts to hinge on this relationship where they care about one another's well being. Um, they they get jealous of one another when Joe is picked up by a woman and Rizzo's at this party yeah. and feels kind of spurned by that. Uh, they live together. Uh, they escape New York together at the very end in this kind of tragic sequence. Um, so there are explicitly gay moments in the sex work aspect of it. Um, but the real ex- exploration of queerness or homosocial relationships wow. is through Joe and Rizzo. Yeah. And I'm just, very like, curious, like if any listeners want to recommend, um, we've talked, these are American and, and Canadian filmmakers and this notion of like commerce and how all of them are, if you're a hustler, like, is that not the most individual, like my success is based on my hard work or like my ability to game, to play Mm. the game. I'm curious how this maybe has been approached in other cultures and countries. Um, Yeah. Cause I've seen stuff that does feature like women in other from in other countries, but um, have, just tell me what to watch. This is like, this is the point of this show is I want more things to watch and yeah. think about more macho, macho content. content. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So that the ex- exploration of queerness is fascinating in, in hustler white. It's much more overt, obviously, because it takes place in the world of, uh, gay sex work to begin with. But, Monty Ward still is like, I don't like refuses to identify himself and says, I'm a hustler. Like that's, that's what it is. Um, but on that to kind of lighten up the convo would love to just talk about hustler white as just one of the funniest Hollywood satires I've seen recently. Um, it is a genius portrayal of how sex work is portrayed in Hollywood media, mainstream Hollywood films. So there's commentary on films about male Mm -hmm. sex workers like midnight cowboy with that cowboy scene. I mentioned, uh, there's some hints of American gigolo in there, another great film. Uh, and then kind of commenting on the entertainment machine at large. I mean, taking its format directly from sunset Boulevard, uh, has an incredible ending (laughs) inspired by whatever happened to baby Jane. Um, but some some choice examples for you. So Jurgen is nar- narrating the whole thing. He's in LA on a, a trip to research the hustling scene. He's talking into a tape recorder the whole time. And when he first lays eyes on hustler Monty Ward, he's kind of referring to himself in the third person. He's like, oh my God, this man is so beautiful. And he says, Jurgen <laughs> perceives this as love at first sight. For the young man, he's one of many potentially wow. thousands of tricks of the day. And it's like, really trying to impose a morality on there that we see in kind of, you and, know, hooker with a, a heart of gold now. films. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and similar to, I found this parallel really interesting. Both scene or both films have scenes with children where the main characters are kind mm. of redeemed by how good they are or with kids. So in Midnight Cowboy, we see Joe Buck on the bus to New York city, kind of playing like peekaboo with this young girl uh, in the seat next to him and just being kind of a delightful young man. Um, and then in Hustler White, there's a storyline where Monty explains to Jurgen, interviewing him that he has a baby. He got a woman pregnant and has been left with the baby. We see him in the bathtub playing with this kid. It's so cute. 
And at the time, like it's, it's very early on in the film. It's like, Oh wow. Like what a redeeming moment. He's such a good dad. Right. That is completely abandoned through the rest of the thing. And it's like, Oh, that was another kind of send up of these Hollywood tropes of like morality and sex work, which I think are like the stakes for that in gay sex work are so different. Right. Like, I don't think anybody would care or feel and, bad. And that also he has a that kid. like men um, having a positive relationship with children is like valued so much. Whereas like women's positive relationship yes. with children is like so tenuous. And in Boogie Nights, you have Julianne Moore's character exactly. whose son has been taken away from her, which mm. she turns into this uh, twisted electric complex or not electro edible complex with yes. Dirk Ziggler. Or I think of the yep. Florida Project and uh, the mm. character, you know, it's hinted at the fact that she's seeing clients in the hotel room while her daughter is right. alone in the bathtub. When you said bathtub, it's the first thing I thought of, which, right. um, but for Absolutely. how we perceive men as being morally good with a capital G. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great take. Totally. Um goes far beyond just a Hollywood trope. Um, but at the end, I think the ending deserves a shout out because it is so funny. It <laughs> Monty slips on a bar of soap by a jacuzzi. Oh, that's and why he was face down at the beginning. <laughs> his face down, like Sunset Boulevard, <laughs> we find out why he's dead. Jurgen is shocked, bundles up his body in a white sheet and takes him to Malibu. And they sit on the beach with his ostensibly dead body. There are shots of him where Monty Ward is trying so hard to hold his breath, but you can see him like fluttering his eyelashes. Um, and at the end, he wakes up, spits out a bunch of water, and then he and Jurgen spend like a two minute sequence running on the beach oh and doing gosh. cartwheels together. <laughs> um, which is is very similar to Midnight Cowboy. There is a moment where Rizzo, Dustin Hoffman's kind of grifter, con man character, is fantasizing about him and Joe moving to Florida. And every fantasy he has about them in Florida is them making it big, running this resort, and being together. He is present in wow. every single scene of this fantasy. It's not just a, a I'm going to get out of this town on my own. It, it, it hinges on this relationship. Um, so I like to think that this Hustler White moment was a bit of a, an homage. I think at the end of this season, we're going to have solved the problem um, of male friendship. <laughs> yes <laughs> we end. are getting you friends period oh <laughs> yeah um but anyway i just to end i think that like the brilliance of hustler white especially watching it in conversation with midnight cowboy is that it forces the audience mm -hmm. into an industry like you're in an industry you're in a workplace um and it like forces the audience to treat sex and sexuality mm -hmm. and commerce as something that is funny or unserious um, that is commercial um, and something that's like, you know, key to gay life in LA, especially at the time, which I think was 1996. Um, there yeah. was like no sensationalizing it at all. It's sensational to watch certainly, but I think the take it, the takeaway at the end of the day is it's, it's showbiz baby. And with that, we will be right back to share this season's version of the freak out macho of the week. Hey, FFR listeners, are you signed up to our Patreon yet? If you're not, you're missing out on special content made exclusively for our patrons. And if you're not a patron, that means that you're not helping me get paid. And if you're not helping me get paid, that means my good little dog Griffin isn't getting the good treats. Head on over to patreon.com slash femfreak. That's F-E-M-F-R-E-Q. Become a patron to get great content and also to make sure my dog Griffin gets the good treats. Oh, and you get the good treats as well, which in your case would be quality discussions about media. All right, now it is time to talk about the matcha that's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us this past week. Uh, this week we got Cat's pick. Uh, he is probably the macho of the 20th century, Arnold Schwarzenegger, but he's macho of the week this week for uh, what he chooses to talk about, what he chooses to um, give voice to on his platform. Uh, I just saw writer, director, comedian Danielle Silverstone talk on TikTok about a video that Arnold Schwarzenegger posted on Twitter the other day where he talks about anti-Semitism and those who choose ideologies of hate. Uh, Danielle, who's Jewish, said she sobbed throughout the entire video. 
It's linked in the show notes and it's very emotional to watch. I also want to like it starts with him talking about a trip to visit the concentration camp at Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. The first, I don't know, four minutes of this video are uh, portrayals of the Holocaust. You can skip ahead to that if that's not something that you want to see. But um, he, he very sincerely talks about uh, he's speaking to people who might become members of hate groups and that's really interesting. He uh, Arnold has talked about growing up in Austria after World War II, raised by a father who was a Nazi and who was wow. a man that coped with the fact that the hateful ideology he believed in lost. And what's really interesting is this kind of like Arnold being the macho and talking about masculinity and strength and um, challenges. He's basically saying, don't be a loser. Don't be a weakling who just gives in to hateful ideologies. Um, you have to strengthen your mind just like you have to strengthen your body. And just because, as he says, big tech's algorithms may push you to the extreme. He says, do wow. not take the path of least resistance and fight against that. And it's really something to watch because it's like, I'm Arnold, right? I'm talking to you. Like, there are pictures of him lifting weights <laughs> in this video. Like, it cuts to him uh, just, like, lifting, right? And he's like, it was hard to do that. The weight was heavy on me. But you must, like, you <laughs> must do the hard thing, even if the weight is heavy on you, because you cannot hate people. That was the worst Arnold uh, impression uh, ever. Thank you. <laughs> I thought it was great. Uh and look, he is far from perfect as like a celebrity for people to uh, look up to as former governor mm -hmm. of California or whatever. But it's really powerful when people in his position use their platform to talk about stuff like this and call out racists. And specifically, he talks about um, he's talking about anti-Semitism. He's using the Holocaust as an example and with his personal experience as an Austrian. but. Um, it, he's like saying, if you hate people based on their religion, race, gender, or sexuality, you are a loser and don't give in to being a loser. Yeah. So I think that he's showing some really uh, important values here and I'm giving him Macho of the Week for that. Oh my God. Congrats, Arnold. <laughs> yeah, we'll be in right. touch. Um, I think also just to get my little theory yes. brain out there, I think a lot about the phrase toxic masculinity and how that gets conflated a lot with masculinity period, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, which I think is not accurate and a little unfair, but I think it's, it's really kind of cool the way that this is using honestly positive right. masculinity still, you know, foundational kind of tenets of masculinity, which is like success and, you know, mm -hmm. being a leader um, to promote something that is objectively good and kind. Um, I don't know. I the the kind of loser language like is working. I, I, me, I'm not absolutely, lie. <laughs> and like that conflation with strength as a masculine quality. In this video, yeah. he talks about a an old older uh, old woman, an elderly woman, a Holocaust survivor that he spoke to, and he talks about her incredible strength. And I think that's great because mm. he's saying, yes, of course, I am. Yeah. I'm Mr. Olympus. I'm the king of physical strength. I know about that. But also, right. we got to talk about our mental strength, our emotional strength, resilience. These are strong qualities that you want to have. And yeah. I, I fully agree that like using positive masculinity, right, is a way to fight against patriarchy. And fight yeah, against the absolutely. ways that patriarchy also harms men. Right. I'll always think about Rob Delaney, comedian, um, hirsute yeah. gentleman, who <laughs> said, it's so weird that the best, my best uh, tool to fight the patriarchy is to be a good father to my sons. Right. And right. like, agree. Um, so absolutely. yeah, use your strongman pulpit to, uh, to talk to, guys on the internet who love watching predator and maybe they'll yep. maybe they'll hear what they need to hear yeah thank you arnold and congrats <laughs> yeah.
And I, I really do think, <laughs> oh boy, I am going to do a bad Photoshop at the end of this season. Um, you know how like on America's Next Top Model, the the model that got kicked off would like evaporate? <laughs> Yes. So I want there to be like on RuPaul's Drag Race um, All Stars Hall of Champions. There's there's like the Ooh. pictures on the wall of Chad Michaels in Alaska. Oh my <laughs> so god! So we need yes. the Machos yes. of the Week, and it's Austin Butler like welcoming Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> <laughs> into the champagne room or whatever. <laughs> oh my god! We will make it happen. There's oh, gonna be a weight beautiful. rack. I mean, I mean. Honestly, like <laughs> I could build this an Animal Crossing. We're oh doing my it. god, we're doing it! Bring it to the metaverse. <laughs> uh... <laughs> This has been our show for today. Thank you, listeners, for joining us for this season. Feminist Frequency Radio presenting Machos Fully Loaded. I am AC Lamberty, and you can follow me on Instagram and Letterboxd at AC Lamberty. Um, and on Letterboxd, we have a list going of the films that we've discussed on this season. I'm Kat Spada. I'm on Twitter at Kat underscore EX underscore Machina. You can uh, follow Feminist Frequency on all the socials at FemFreak. And if you are a Patreon subscriber, please stick around. We are going to have a bonus episode kind of building upon this conversation. We want to talk about some recent discourse about sex scenes in movies. Mm. Is it generational? Is it going away? We have lots to say. Uh, if you like the show, help other people find it by subscribing, rating, and commenting on your favorite app. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.